Okay, welcome everyone to F4S Digital Events, where we invite inspiring speakers from the world of work to tell their career story. Today, we are exploring careers in the exciting field of cybersecurity. I'm Kat, and I'll be hosting today's session. For everyone watching, your audio, video, and chat function has been disabled for safeguarding purposes. If you are submitting questions, can you click the anonymous button? And if we are unable to answer your questions today, I do apologize in advance. We are recording the session and you'll be able to watch again on YouTube and share with friends. So sit back and enjoy the webinar, take some notes and get ready to ask some questions. I am delighted today to be able to welcome Malcolm Moore and Emma Philpott to our session. Thank you, Malcolm and Emma, for giving up your time today and for agreeing to share your story. You do have an audience spanning the length and breadth of the UK. And Malcolm, if I can ask you, first of all, just to start telling us about your career journey and what you've done um, to end up in the position that you're in today. Hi, well, welcome everybody. Um, I'm just gonna canter through a few slides. Can you see the slides? Okay, I'm going to come to through a few slides here, really just to illustrate that I've had a, should we say, a non-standard career pattern. Uh, and really the message I'm going to try and give over in the next 10 minutes is that you never stop learning and you keep on finding out new opportunities. And it's particularly so in the cyber security field, which of course when I was at your age, there was nothing called cyber security. So I've had to grow into it over the years. And I found that my experiences from previous careers have helped me a lot in understanding what we need to do now to protect our digital environment. So here's a few quick slides. And the first one I've put up here is what I term the yellow brick road, being a very old person. Your parents will tell you what that means in terms of uh, uh, an old film. Uh, I've just put up a few things that I've done over the years just to illustrate that uh, it's not been straightforward. Um, I started off by joining the Royal Navy uh, literally, I joined on the last day I was allowed in. I got uh, an engineering scholarship to go to Manchester, and I decided I was going to be very boring, so I joined the Navy instead, which was much more fun. But prior to that, when I was at school, I was in the Sea Scouts, learned quite a lot about people relate. Uh, I also did an outward bound school uh, session, which taught me a lot about myself. And uh, I ran the Meteorological Society at school. And all of those things actually helped me significantly as I moved through my career path. But I was asked to just put a few things up about people and things that inspired me both then and since. When I was 13, I got into terrible trouble with my mother for actually making a crystal radio set, which your grandparents will tell you about, so I could listen to the radio at one o'clock in the morning. Now you can all do that on the internet, of course, that didn't exist in my day. And then I was very lucky when I went to secondary school to be taken quite often to school by the owner of a major book uh, sellers in Birmingham, in fact, the major bookseller. And he used to give me lots of books, lots of different books, all sorts of books, some of which my mother thought was a bit risky, but they were great fun because I learned a lot from reading books. And then I also was very lucky when I was 14 to go to a talk by the gentleman in the middle who was known as Uncle Bill. And Uncle Bill was probably our UK's outstanding soldier in the Second World War. And he talked about leadership, how you manage people, how you use technology and so on and so forth. All of these I found incredibly useful. And while I was at school, I did uh, the usual standard things. I was very keen on physics, very keen on mathematics, particularly pure mathematics. But also I delved into history, geography, uh, all sorts of things like that. But I also did other things, which is very important. Formal learning and informal learning need to go together in practice. So I built myself a go-kart, got into trouble because it had no brakes, almost knocked over a little old lady down the street. Um, I joined the Sea Scouts, as I mentioned, and in those days we used to have comic books. They don't really exist any longer, but I used to read comic books, which was a light-hearted, as it were, approach to how you might learn. And that's my school bus, by the way. 
Anyway, so uh, I left school. Uh, as I said, I was supposed to be going directly to university, but I thought I'd join the Navy. So this is what I did. And here I am in a submarine. It's, I'm in a type of submarine uh, at 200 feet, or where it should be. This was the one that I was in, which was HMS Warspite. I learned an awful lot about how people operate in a very closed environment when they're put under pressure. I learned about high technology and how that's best used. All very useful, by the way, for a later career, particularly in terms of cyber. And I was asked to put a little slide up which shows the things I think I've done well and the things I haven't done so well, the things I've failed at. Um, I put two up uh, in failed terms. One is uh, the fact I tried to blow up my school on one occasion. I'm not going to tell any of you how I tried to do it, but it didn't work. And I got into real trouble for that. But I learned a lot about chemistry as a result. And the other one was trying to run a shipyard. And the problem with running a shipyard is that you had people from lots of different nationalities. And I hadn't really understood that different nationalities think differently, they act differently, they have different cultures. That's also very relevant, by the way, in cyber security. But I had a few successes. One was a BBC Micro, which for those of you who are into Raspberry Pi, was my generation of Raspberry Pi. And we used to do all sorts of mad things with BBC Micro, including putting them in submarines, by the way. And then later on, I visited Kazan, which is a city the size of Birmingham in Russia. Uh, I learned to speak Russian, and I found out that the Russians are really quite nice people, even if we think they want to try and fight with us all the time. Uh, and right on the other corner is a young man who I support in Rwanda. He's now 19, and guess what? He wants to become a cyber engineer, as they tell us in Rwanda. So those are the sorts of things that I think I did successfully and some that I didn't do too well. And I had some great fun meeting some very interesting people I was growing up. I wonder how many of you know who this is. You might work it out from Lord of the Rings in the top corner. So do put a question in about him and who uh, that, what that meant to me. And then I have met them. I think Emma's met them as well for various reasons. Um, really interesting to meet the royal family. Uh, and him, and perhaps somebody can tell me who that one is as well. Very akin to cyber, by the way. Uh, and lastly, this one. And he was a Russian submarine commander who I met on a cruise down the Volga River and we had long chats about how to operate in submarines, which shows that sometimes you can learn from the enemy just as much as you can learn from the friend. So what have I learned? I think two or three things I've learned is uh, Bill Gates, I've also met. You never stop learning, as I mentioned right at the beginning, and people are important, and never give up on something you're trying to do. Keep on going at it. So what do I do now? Well, very quickly, I chair some companies. I look after a couple of, uh, three or four actually, small cyber companies in different types. who are all trying to make their way in the world, some doing them more successfully than others. Uh, I do a few things with people. I had uh, was helping somebody last night, actually, who's not feeling so well, the answer of lockdown. And I keep on finding out from around the world what's going on, which I find is great fun. What do I enjoy most? Contributing. That's what I enjoy most. And there's no reason why you, your age group, can't contribute as well. And having an inquiring mind is really important. So quickly, what skills have I learned? Well, I've learned three. Listening is often better than transmitting. And I know this is a session for me telling you what I do, but listening is really important. Learning from your mistakes is really valuable. Uh, it doesn't mean to say that you won't make mistakes in the future, but you'll probably do something of a better job if the same issue comes up again. And the last one is go out and find out things which uh, are sometimes quite challenging. And if necessary, get a helping, help, a helping hand to help you with it. Just a couple of tips. These are mine, by the way. Believe in yourself. Work hard. Dream a lot. And never give up. And lastly, have integrity. Learn from each other. And take your time. So that's everything from me. I'll now hand over to Emma. And hopefully I can clip this off 
so she can carry on with uh, telling you a bit more in depth about what cyber security is. Right. Thank Thanks, you very Mark. much. Oh, uh, sorry, I'll, I'll just pass on and just say thanks, Malcolm. And there are quite a lot of um, opportunities for uh, the students today to be asking questions for that. And if you don't, I'll get in first because I've got some. Um, but Emma, if you um, want to take over now and just share your experience with us, that would be great. Okay. Okay, so um, this is actually me um, with my pet lamb. So my only real uh, career objective in my life was to be a vet. This was when I was quite little and I really, really wanted to be a vet. Um, the rest of my career planning uh, really was just subject to a series of circumstances, um, just sort of going through life and ending up in different places. And actually that has been quite good. I've, I've enjoyed doing that. So I always focused on science because to be honest, I found that I finished my science homework quicker than I did essays. So I found it easier, so I did science. I'm very glad that I did because I find it um, a good basis to have adventures and do exciting things. Um, doing science, I went to university and unfortunately I was doing physics and chemistry and I started to find it really challenging. Um, I really found particularly physics very difficult. I was going to be a physicist. That just wasn't going to work. So there was another science that I was also doing at university called material science that was easier than physics and chemistry. So I ended up being a material scientist. Um, having become a material scientist, I really liked it because it's about real things. It's about concrete or electronics or metals and I found that to be really exciting and great. So I became a material scientist because I couldn't do physics. Um, I always as a child lived near a Ministry of Defence research site. So of course I applied there um, for summer work and I worked there in the summer, really enjoyed it. When I graduated my university there was a massive recession maybe a little bit like what might happen soon. Um, so I applied for lots of jobs and didn't get any um, offers. But the MOD, um, because I worked for them in the summer, they accepted me. So I worked for the MOD because it was an opportunity that was there. Having started at the MOD, it was amazing. It was brilliant. So um, I got to do all sorts of things. I got to be on a submarine like Malcolm. <laughs> Um, I got um, posted to Hong Kong for a couple of months. Um, I got to answer letters from the public. I got to brief ministers. Amazing, amazing things. And I think those opportunities come from working in any large organization. Uh, you can really take advantage of all the breadth of things that they do. Um, then we decided that we wanted to live in a different country. So my husband got a job in Singapore and I went along um, and managed to get various little jobs that I could find but all of it adds to your experience everywhere that you go everything that you're doing even if it's not what you want to be doing it is adding to your experience so there is no such thing as any wasted time it's all helping uh, so I came back to Malvern and there was another recession I seemed to be blighted by making moves in recessions nobody was investing in material science and so what was I to do everyone I met in Malvern was working in cyber security. I'd never really heard of cyber security. I'd never considered it. This was only 10 years ago, but I started finding out about it and cyber security has got so much space. What do I mean by that? I mean, it is relatively new. There is so much to do and just not enough people. So much to do, so little time. There is just so many opportunities in cybersecurity. So I launched myself into it thinking, well, how hard can it be? So I didn't have the technical knowledge, but I had experience from the many other things that I'd done in terms of understanding small companies, um, understanding people, uh, understanding different kinds of technology in the, in the world. And so although I didn't know anything about cybersecurity, I could do lots of things in cybersecurity. So I started a, an informal networking group. And then I became CEO of a company called IASME. It stands for Information Assurance for Small and Medium-Sized Enterprises, which is a bit of a mouthful. Uh, really, we focus on cybersecurity for normal people. So when I first came into it, cybersecurity was really kind of geeky. It was very expensive and very big companies did cybersecurity and nobody else did. 
that's luckily changing and si and IASME tries to help normal people who don't know about technology understand how to be secure so you don't actually need to know a lot of depth of cyber security of course we've got experts that do but most of IASME is about the common sense and explaining to people it's not that hard and just change a few settings and change your password and you'll be much more secure um, also, I started working with neurodiverse people, so that's a very politically correct word. It includes people with autism and ADHD and dyslexia, all those kind of things that make you perhaps think in a different way, but can make you actually better at cybersecurity than people without those things. And that's what's really interesting. So there are a lot of people out there who maybe don't have jobs because they find the social aspect really difficult or they haven't managed with school or they haven't managed with uh, university. Um, and they may be unemployed, but they are secret hidden talent and they can be better than people without those neurodiversities. So I started working in that as well. 10 years later, 10 years from when I had never heard of cybersecurity, I was awarded an MBE for services to cybersecurity. And I think that just goes to show that you can do, you can move around and do anything. And as long as you um, use your experience from the different areas, you can move into lots of different um, careers and, and you can just drift around and have fun. So my motto really is, how hard can it be? Just have a go. Rather than thinking, oh, I can't do that because I'm not a that expert, have a go. You can always find people who know and can advise you and you can just give it a go. Also, um, I've always looked forwards. I find it very difficult to remember. <laughs> In fact, I found this talk quite difficult to remember what I have done because I always look forward to the exciting things. And change can be worrying. Um, at the moment, we're going through lots of change. But all change includes opportunities. And so it's a case of looking for those opportunities, looking for opportunities to have adventures. There's adventures in all jobs. And um, if there aren't, you should maybe look for a different job. Finally, I just wanted to talk about not following the common path. So this is something that I've experienced through my daughter um, who dropped out of school at 14 because she's neurodiverse and she wasn't managing to cope with school. So she dropped out at 14, she had no GCSEs, no A-levels, and there is an overwhelming feeling that, oh, if you don't have the right GCSEs, or you don't have the right A-levels, or you don't have the right degree, you know, that's it. You won't get a good job. And that is completely, completely wrong. So she dropped out of school, did no qualifications, and then at the age of 18, when she felt ready for it, she got a job as an apprentice. And then just a year and a half later, she has the equivalent of two A-levels and, and two GCSEs. She's a, got a good job. She's getting good experience. And she can move on from there. She could go to university. She could get other jobs. She could, she could do all sorts of things. You can become an apprentice with no qualifications at any age. And it is never too late to start or to change. And I think that's the, the most important thing. You don't have to decide on your career now. You can just take it step by step do what you enjoy and follow the adventure. And then before you know it, you'll have a career. So that was all I was going to say. Um, thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Emma, as well. I think what I have taken from that is, and I'm sure it will bring comfort to an awful lot of young people, um, is that even if you try at something and you fail at it, you can still make a real success of your life and you know you spoke about the job applications during the recession and not getting any um, jobs out of it but you kept trying and you got one um, eventually and you know you've traveled the world you've um, got an MBE so a really successful career and I think as well um, you know sort of mirroring your your daughter's um, experience you don't have to follow down the, the route that people might think, you know, go to university, you, there are other options for everybody out there. So thank you very much um, think, for sharing that. I think just to add, I think some of the best um, people I've had in cybersecurity haven't got university qualifications. As Emma said, sometimes it's the people who think differently that make the best contribution. 
Yeah. Okay. So we do have um, some questions. So for both of you, you both seemed to take a lot of STEM subjects. Is that, you know, the science, the maths, is that what you would recommend students to take? Um, yes. Yeah, so, well, I, I took STEM subjects because I enjoyed them. Um, that was the main reason that I did it. Certainly, if you want to do cybersecurity, it is easier to go into cybersecurity if you do things like maths and computer science. And usually, if you enjoy maths and computer science, you're more likely, I think, to enjoy the technical side of cybersecurity. But at the same time, I work with people in cybersecurity who've got a degree in um, politics, um, history, uh, music. There are lots of musicians working in cybersecurity. So don't, you don't need to feel that there is one thing that you need to do, but certainly it's easier if you do maths and computer science, I would say. Okay. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think um, and the STEM subjects give you a basic. I mean, I love pure maths um, very similarly, but that doesn't mean to say everybody in the cyber security industry has to be a pure mathematician. But English, mathematics, and, and the other STEM subjects give you a very good grounding for almost anything you want to do later on, I think. And I, I think both of you have touched on this as well. I mean, Emma, you said when you um, went into the cybersecurity field, you, you didn't know anything about it, but you'd learned a lot through your career. And I'm just, you, you touched on it as well, Malcolm. So how important are the sort of learning the soft skills in comparison to learning, you know, the, the sort of get, getting the qualifications? Or, or is it just a balance of both of them? Well, I, I think it's a balance, actually, but, uh, and the balance might change in certain circumstances. Um, but there's no doubt that awareness, if you like, of other people, and in the case of cybersecurity, potentially awareness that your adversary will think differently and act differently to you is very important. In the early days of, of we'll call it cyber defense, there was a, he a very heavy concentration on technology solutions. People are now beginning to realize, and I've seen lots of examples of where the technology is not the driving requirement, it's how people operate and react to it that's important. And that requires an understanding of human beings. Yes. I, th I think there's so many different roles in cybersecurity. It's like saying engineering. You know, if you say engineering, there's electrical and mechanical and civil. In cybersecurity, there's also many, many different things. So there's the sort of the ethical hacker where you have to, you know, try and break into systems and you tend to be very technical for that. Uh, but you also have to understand human behavior because you're trying to catch people out. There are um, uh, analysts who look at lots and lots and lots of data and try and see um, changes in the data and changes in the patterns. Um, to see, you know, if someone has broken into your systems, you can only tell that by seeing the changes in the patterns. There are um, people who do understanding risk of different companies. So this isn't maybe so technical, but being able to look at all the systems that a company is using or a person is using and understand where the risks might be and what you might be able to do about them. That's a very important aspect. And then there's business continuity. So if something happens to your computer systems, you need a plan you know, what would happen. So there are people who need expertise in those as well. And then there are people at designing secure systems. So, uh, and in fact, secure coding is a, is a very, very important area. And then there is the human behavior people. So if you tell everyone to have a very, very long password and change it every day, they're not going to do it and they will start cutting corners. And so the understanding of the human mind is also really important. So it's almost anything that you enjoy, slightly technical, you can have a great career in cybersecurity. Yeah, yeah. okay, because that does kind of relate to one of the questions that's come in and they've asked what a cybersecurity jobs entails on a day-to-day -day basis. But I guess it depends which part of cybersecurity you're in because it would be different. But they are asking, I mean, there's, is it mostly kind of implementing programs or is it working with clients or does it just depend what phase you go into? Um, so I think it completely depends. So um, a lot of people work with clients um, and they advise them on their systems. They, they help them be more secure. Um, but then other people will, will work in a dark room watching 
to see if there's anything that goes wrong on a system. So those are SOC analysts, uh, Secure Operations Center analysts, and they are very, very highly valued. And they are there to watch the internal network. And if anything happens, if they spot anything, it's like one of those American war movies, um, all the alarms go and they have to work out what's going on and what to do about it. So there's an immense um, variety of different things that you can be doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay. Yeah, I think I've, I've run similar groups. I think also because it's, it's such a dynamic career, is rather like Emma said earlier, and the same happened to me, is if you don't quite fit into that particular job specification, you can actually move across to something else. So you might find that actually marketing is something that you'd be rather better at than coding. Uh, and that's one of the big advantages of this fairly new horizon of cybersecurity, is there is plenty of flexibility in, in, uh, in jobs, and therefore job creation and job enjoyment. Yeah. Okay, so both of you also spoke about knowing people that didn't have university degrees and we've spoken about the, the different routes in. So specifically to get into a cyber security career, do you recommend taking a degree apprenticeship or a degree in computer science cyber security to get into the industry? So, um, so I would, so the apprenticeships are only really just coming online at the lower level an apprenticeship in cybersecurity is very good because you get started in work and you get experience and with cybersecurity a lot of it is experience so uh, certainly cybersecurity apprenticeships are very highly recommended um, so even GCHQ takes on cybersecurity apprentices so um, and you can do a degree level apprentice apprenticeship if that's what you want um, Doing a university degree, you can do it in forensics or cybersecurity or computer science. And that also is a good grounding um, for moving into cybersecurity. There's a skill shortage in cybersecurity. They're looking for good people and they don't have enough. They're really, really short of good people. And the salaries are high. <laughs> um, so it's a, it's a good thing to go into at the moment. Yeah, I think... Um very simplistically is that when this kicked off 10 years or so ago, generally it was thought you needed a degree to do so. Now, definitely not. And as Emma has illustrated, both the National Cyber Security Center, part of GCHQ and other organizations have recognized that people don't need a degree. They need good practical skills, good awareness, good determination and all those other things which uh, are life skills, if you like, rather than technical skills. Okay, so I've got a question uh, from someone who is planning to go to university and they're asking if they should start looking for ways to get into business whilst at university. Should they start making contacts with them? I, I, I mentor a few people at uh, university actually or just left university and I think um, to come back to my original pitch is it's quite useful to pick up a mentor, particularly again in this dynamic field. So there's no harm done if you uh, have a trusted friend who's in business or you can rely on during your passage through university or higher education, just occasionally touch base with them and just to sort of use them as a bit of a steerage for what you want to do. I find um, quite a number of, of, of young people have found that quite useful from my personal collection and some of um, my colleagues who've done it similar. And also at university, there's lots of opportunities such as there's, there's an organization called Immersive Labs and they do really, really good online training and any UK university student, and I think Australia and Singapore as well, can have free access to the Immersive Labs training platform. So, so one of the things that I would advise is while you're at university, do a bit of extra stuff to show that you're interested. So when, when you get interviewed by an employer, what they want to see is that you're interested in the subject. And so if you've just done your degree and done nothing else and now you're looking for a job they'll be less keen on having you than if you say well I've done my degree but I also in the evenings did a little bit of immersive labs and maybe I joined cybersecurity challenge which is another really really great thing um, don't worry too much you know it, it it it's not make or break that you do these things but it really helps to show that you're interested in the subject okay and thank you and you again you spoke I think Emma about uh, working for a large organization and the opportunities it affords. Is it better to go for a large organization rather than a smaller one? 
So that's really difficult. There's <laughs> benefits in both. So with a large organization, they usually have lots of different um, topics and departments that you can move between and you have yeah the opportunity probably to travel because they probably have more money but if you work for a small company everyone is expected to pitch in and so you probably get more um, responsibility quite early and you might be doing more cutting edge things so I think it depends and I think over your whole career it's really useful to have some time working for a large organization and some time to try and work for a small organization Okay, that's good advice. Okay, yeah, unfortunately, I've had the same thing. large and small organisations internet, really good idea. Yeah. Okay, unfortunately, we have run out of time, and there are a number of questions I've got, but I can ask them afterwards. I know. Um, so I'd just like to say thank you to you both for sharing your story, and I'm sure all those watching today are a way to study hard, find out the best companies to work for, and um, so that they can follow their chosen career path. I um, also want to thank all the students that joined us today. Um, we will be emailing you a uh, survey feedback. We would ask you if you could complete this so that we can improve our sessions going forward. And um, if a career in cyber security isn't for you, have a look at the other webinars on our YouTube channel. I'm sure you'll find something that will inspire you. And if you aren't already following us, we are on Twitter and Instagram. Our next session will be tomorrow at 11.30 a.m. and we'll focus on the importance of maths in your career. So again, thanks to Malcolm and Emma and to everybody else for joining us today and we shall um, see you all again soon, hopefully. Thank you, bye.